Good evening. Good evening. Oh, okay, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. My name is Novella Ford, and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions. Thank you for joining us here in Harlem, and for those who are joining us online. I'm going to ask everybody in here to please silence your cell phones. And if you're looking to share tonight's conversation with others, it can be viewed online at youtube.com forward slash the Schomburg Center, all one word. As you all know, through conversations, performances, film screenings, exhibitions, and more, we explore historical and contemporary narratives that continue to shape Harlem, this nation, and the world. Just to give you a sense of what's coming up, next week will be a system-wide stand against the current wave of book bannings. We are focused on Beloved by Toni Morrison, um, and we have a really wonderful group of writers and um, actor and actors and theater performers who will read, discuss, as well as perform um, in honor of Beloved. We also have an after-hours viewing of Boundless, an exhibition here dedicated to the Black imagination through Black creators of comics and comic fandom. And all of October, we expect you to be here basically every week. We have White House correspondent April Ryan. We have Trisha Hersey, who people may know on social media as part of as the founder of the Nat Ministry. We have Wendell Pierce in the cast, the black cast of Death of a Salesman, the Black Women's Film Festival, a look at and a look at women of the Black Panther Party through the lens of photographer Stephen Shames in the words of Erica Huggins. So I invite you to learn more about the Schomburg Center and our upcoming programs by visiting our website at schomburg.org. To turn to tonight's program, I'll start off with a bit from the foreword. When they say literature liberates, surely they were talking about freedom dreams. This is the opening line to the poet and activist Aja Monet's foreword to the 20th anniversary edition of Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination by Professor Robin D.G. Kelly. And so I want to take this moment to transport us to another place taking a few cues on imagination and love from one of our literary foremothers from a scene in Toni Morrison's Beloved in the Clearing. So Setha has reached Cincinnati, and into the arms of her mother-in-law we come to know as Baby Suggs. Baby Suggs, it says, decided that because slave life had busted her legs, back, head, eyes, hands, kidneys, womb, and tongue, she had nothing left to make a living but her heart, which she put to work at once. In the wide open woods, she lays it plain, and while rousing those gathered in the clearing, she states, here in this place, we flesh, flesh that weeps and laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet and grass. Love it, love it hard. Yonder, they don't love you, your flesh. Hear me. They do not love your neck unnoosed and straight. So love your neck, put your hand on it, grace it, stroke it, and hold it up. We take our weeping, laughing, loving flesh wherever we go, and it is ever needed in our freedom work. What a pleasure to have with us this evening, Professor Robin D.G. Kelly. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, for revisiting, revising, and expanding your work 20 years later at a time when love and imagination can feel in short supply. Professor Kelly is a distinguished professor and Gary B. Nash Endowed Chair in U.S. History at UCLA. He is the author and co-editor of numerous award-winning books, including Thelonious Monk, The Life and Times of an American Original, Your Mama's Dysfunctional, Fighting the Culture Wars in Urban America, and Race Rebels, Culture, Politics, and the Black Working Class, among others. I'm equally excited to welcome Olufemi Otaiwo, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Georgetown University. His work focuses on Africana and social political philosophy and emphasizes themes and figures from anti-capitalist, anti-colonial, and black radical traditions of thought and practice. He is also the author of Reconsidering Reparations and the latest Elite Capture, How the Powerful Took Over Identity Politics and Everything Else. Plan to get your, <laughs> it's a pretty good one, and it's a small book too, so it's a quick read. Plan to get your copy of Freedom Dreams and Elite Capture in the Schomburg shop today. Dr. Kelly will be signing books following tonight's conversation. 
And of course, if tonight is not the night for purchasing, please check them out from your local library. And if they're not in your local library, ask if that suits the, the moment and demand if that also suits the moment. With that said, please welcome our moderator, Olufemi, um, Olufemi Sari Taiwo, and our esteemed guest, Robin D. Jean Kelly. Good evening. Can you hear me? Oh, good, it's working. Um, you, have to, you have to give a really warm thank you again to the, the great Novella Ford. I mean, it's just amazing, and, and all the people at the Schomburg. Okay, so it's great to be here. I feel bad because all these people I know didn't come because it was sold out. And they're like, there's no seats. What am I going to do? I said, well, just don't show up. So they could have showed up because there's seats. And I feel bad for them. But you know, that's how it goes. Um, <laughs> and let me, let me just uh, begin. I'm going to read first. And then we're going to have a conversation uh, with my friend and colleague here, uh, Femi. Um, but let me just set this up because I decided, you know, this is, this is home for me. You know, New York is home. This is where I was, where I was born. This is where Freedom Dreams began, and I'll talk more about that. Um, and because this is home, I decided I'm not going to do the typical reading uh, that frames the whole book. We're going to talk about the book. I'm going to read specifically an excerpt that has to do with a dear friend and influence on me, uh, Seku Sundiata. Yes. Um, so if you don't know who Seku is, we'll find out in, in a minute, and we could talk about him. So let me just read that section, and then we'll have a conversation. The late poet Seku Sundiata was my other chief interlocutor. His impact on both the birth and afterlife of Freedom Dreams has been profound. Seku was there from the conception. I titled the Dartmouth Lecture that became the scaffolding for the book Politics and Knowledge on the Poetry of Social Movements, precisely because my talk followed performances by poets Joy Harjo and Sekou during the long Martin Luther King Jr. holiday weekend. The title was meant to be an invitation. Tragically, Sekou never made it. On his way to New Hampshire, he got into a terrible car accident and broke his neck. Miraculously, and if you know Sekou, it's, he's had many lives, uh, he recovered. And fortunately for me, we both ended back up at Dartmouth in the summer of 2000, where we participated in a dialogue with a large group of students. Sekou blew my mind. His brilliance, generosity of spirit, quiet humility, and honesty turned me from a fan to friend to follower. We talked poetry. We talked politics. He invited me to his class at the New School to talk surrealism. And he, he and his wife, Maureen Knighton, uh, invited my family and me to their home in Fort Greene, Brooklyn, for these incredible gatherings of artists, activists, and cultural workers, in which Sekou asked hard questions about the state of the world and sought genuine answers, not bumper sticker slogans or manifestos. A few weeks after the Twin Towers came down on 9-11, we met for lunch to talk about it. He had been in the hospital during the attack, but was soon released into a city of smoke, rubble, and questions for which he was not prepared. He had spent much of his life fighting things American, racism, imperialism, economic inequality, hubris, xenophobia, arrogance, and suddenly felt heartbroken for the American people. This was not the same as patriotism or national loyalty. He told me a story about a crowd of young black men in Harlem who had cheered the attacks on the World Trade Center without considering the loss of human life. As with so many victims of American racism, vengeance came to resemble justice, prompting Sekou to ask whether love, compassion, and human solidarity are possible in these United States. His questions haunted me because I had written the chapter Third World Dreaming without ever questioning the romance of violent revolution or the human costs of anti-imperialist wars. The conversation shook me to the core in part because I witnessed the attack in real time. My talk with Sekou, more than anything else, convinced me to scrap my original epilogue, which is a futuristic tale of maroon poets 
who turned a local struggle over police brutality into a revolutionary movement that takes several centuries to remake the world. Um, and by the way, I reinserted that original epilogue in the new edition, so you can get it there. Um, and you'll see why. We, we could talk about that. In any case, Sekou turned his ruminations on 9-11 into the America Project, a proposed multimedia performance piece for which he asked me to serve as a historical consultant. The proposal, which he completed at the, end of, at the beginning of 2004, asked whether the emergence of the U.S. was a new kind of empire will cost America its soul. Or, put differently, and this, these are his words, what does a public imagination steeped in violence say about who we are? Now, he didn't think the imagination was fixed, either in violence or in utopic dreams of revolution, but rather thought it existed in the place, quote, where the unthinkable is thinkable. At the heart of the America Project was a desire to find ways to be together, to replace the nation's war mentality with the principles of love, compassion, and human solidarity. He elaborated on these ideas in a 2004 talk in which he proposed substituting the corporate and academic project of diversity with the messy practice of democracy. And he writes, when you say democracy, the discussion has to expand, it has to elevate, it has to point us towards the purpose of diversity, and the discussion has to be about more than colored faces in high places. I think we have to insist on linking diversity to democracy. Post 9-11 diversity conversations must have a different sense of time and place and urgency than those old, tired, pre-9-11 conversations. And that's end quote. The imagination is the portal, and artists should lead the way, since in his words, the point is not to diversify the culture, but to change it. And this is precisely what the America Project set out to do. Sekou did his research, held citizenship dinners, led community sings, organized poetry readings, and collected material, stories, and experiences to create his stunning performance piece, The 51st Dream State. He combined poetry, music, dance, and video projections to create not just a performance, but a community-engaged democratic experience that used personal and national stories to reimagine U.S. citizenship and the future of humanity in the 21st century. Sekou modeled what it meant to turn dream into action, to transform freedom dreams from noun to verb. Sadly, he passed in 2007, just 18 months after the 51st Dream State debuted. And this is at the end. It should be clear by now, and will become clearer as you read this book, that the black radical imagination does not stand still. It li lives and breathes and moves with the people. The best we can do is catch a glimpse of how people in motion have envisioned the future and what they did to try to realize or enact that future. But every freedom dream shares a common desire to find better ways of being together without hierarchy and exclusion, without violence and domination, but with love, compassion, care, and friendship. My daughter, Eliza Kelly, who's a professor at Yale University, I'm just bragging, um, <laughs> who lived with this book longer than anyone besides me, grasped this core truth with, ast with astonishing clarity. When asked by an interviewer whether progressive movements can retool citizenship as a way to reproduce a culture of care, she replied, quote, better ships than citizenship include friendship, relationship, or even a pirate ship, <laughs> where unauthorized motley formations are bound together to disrupt notions of the private, of property, of wealth, and its concentration. The kind of citizenship I dream of is one where we acknowledge our attachment to each other, desire to be attached to one another in relations other than property relations, where serving the other is a way of serving the self. It sounds very romantic, but isn't that the origin of all the things we want to make and bring into the world? The power of the love letter is that it is written without the guarantee of a response. And to her, I asked the question, uh, what are radical social movements, if not love letters? Thank you. There we go. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um,
Thank you so much to the Schomburg Center, New York Public Libraries, all the people that worked to put this event together, Novella, Maribel, Kalila, um, all the work that got put into this. Um, and I, of course, have to, in my round of thanks, thank Robin, um, not just for writing this book, which I think is a gift to all of us, but um, I was a grad student at UCLA. Um, a number of the people that I studied with and learned from who were my peers, fellow students, um, you know, people like Mark Vestal and Tabisa Lake Griffin, these are students of Robin's. Um, they were friends and comrades of mine. Um, a lot of, you know, Robin himself and a lot of his colleagues, uh, a lot of the people in the generation of scholars that was teaching me and my friends, you know, they really made it possible not just to imagine, but to imagine in a particular way, to imagine in a way that's informed by this tradition, right? In a way that responds to the generations of people before us who were doing the same thing. And I think that's what the book is really about and what commemorating this book is about for me. You know, there's centuries long history of trying to do this, of trying to think about a different way that the world could be and actually make that real. Um, and I'm just very grateful for that. So I wanted to start off with that round of thanks, but I have, I do have questions. I was about to say, we're done here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you laid out everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful description of what I'm trying to do, so I appreciate that. And I know you have questions, but I have to say, um, there's nothing like, you know, living as long as I've lived and being in my office and having all these beautiful black people, including Femi, with this Afro pick in his head, all plotting to overthrow <laughs> UCLA. <laughs> I mean, not they were in my office plotting. They were the undercommon, right? And they're like, in my office. I'm like, okay, well, don't take me to the guillotine. But, um, but it, was, it was just be a beautiful sight. A beautiful sight. So I, I have to say, I learned way more from you all than, than you all got from me, so. Let's, thank you. Um, I want to, I do want to start off by talking about um, place in a few ways. Right, so we're at, right now we're at the Schomburg Center. This is itself a historic place, a historic achievement. We're in Harlem. It's a historic neighborhood. But also, if I have this right, we're about a mile and a half from 157th and Amsterdam, and you'll recognize that intersection if you um, get to read this book. It's where this all started for you, the political development, and it's where the, the book starts with a kind of moral and political development that you're getting at home. Um, and I'll have a lot more to say about that, but the first question is just, what do these places, the Schomburg, Harlem home, what do they mean to you? And what does it mean to you to get to talk about freedom here as opposed right. to UCLA or anywhere else in the world? You know, that's a great question. I mean, this, this, is a, this book is a product of New York City, no question, as I am. Um, I talk about, you know, living uh, on 157th between Broadway and Amsterdam, going to what was then called the Wright Brothers School or PS28 on 155th in St. Nicholas, and what it meant to grow up with my greatest teacher, my mother, uh, showing us, revealing to us everything that's beautiful about our neighborhood and our community. Because she could see things that other people couldn't see. And she taught us how to see that. Um, and that, in some ways, begins the text. The Schomburg itself, um, this is my archive, I'm sorry. I can claim it because my, my, I did my dissertation. My dissertation research was here in, in the Schomburg in 1986. I spent a lot of time here. Every book I've ever written, Thelonious Monk, Schomburg. I've spent so much time. I was a Schomburg fellow the year I wrote um, Freedom Dreams. I was, I was actually working on Monk, but I had to sort of take time to write this book because of what had happened politically. Um, and I have so many stories, Schomburg stories of being in that audience and seeing uh, amazing things like the day that you know, Paul Gilroy walked off the stage because Sterling Stuckey critiqued him harshly. 
um, standing on this stage and having a responsibility, right, for moderating a panel with Malefi Asante and Maulana Karinga, and I'm supposed to try to end it, and the people are telling me, you know, we're gonna shut down, you gotta, and I'm saying we gotta end, and the people in the audience are booing, sit down, sit your ass down, you know, you wanna hear this, brother? <laughs> I mean, I live to Schomburg, that's the Schomburg, right? And being the greatest archive, really, in North America, I mean, in terms of the materials. So there's that. Um, and then finally, the last part about New York City, this book was immeasurably shaped by 9-11. And reading about Sekou, uh, you know, brought back a lot of memories about how traumatic that experience was living downtown uh, uh, Lower Manhattan and seeing what I saw. And, you know, when you read the book, you'll see the impact that it had. Uh, but, you know, so much of what we thought was possible um, seemed to shatter. And that was the, the context, the context for the book was the verdict around the, uh, after the murder of Amadou Diallo and 9-11. Those, those are the bookends. Um, and so that's something we could talk about. So this is also a, very much a New York story um, in, in many ways. So this is a kind of homecoming for me. Uh, there's no more important city uh, for this book and for me than New York City, and especially here. I want to I want to uh, follow up on two things you just said. Uh, maybe I'll start with the Schomburg. So it's clear that you lived the Schomburg, right? Um, if there was a, a story or a fact or a sentence, a paragraph that you could say to somebody who didn't know what this was, mm -hmm. that would quickly get across to them what this place is and what it means, what would it be? Black People's Archive. Mm. This is the Black People's Archive. I mean, I could tell you a little, a little story uh, about being here doing research on the Communist Party in 1986. And you know, being in a reading room, and of course there's more than one, there's, there's, there's special collections and there's a general reading room. And I remember seeing all these young black men and women, teenagers, you call them, they're, they're children, coming into the Schomburg doing research to write rhymes. Hmm. I mean, I saw that with my own eyes. I'm not making it up. They would come and they would get books and they were like trying to write rhymes. They're reading books to write rhymes. That is what the Schomburg is. It's the people's library. And of course, Arturo Schomburg himself built this collection that um, understood the black world, not just in North America, not just in Harlem, but all over the globe. The Schomburg is a place where I, in, in either indirect ways or direct ways, connected with John Henry Clark. If you've never heard of John Henry Clark, you should know who he is, with Dr. Ben, right? I mean, these are the people who were the people's historians, right? And there was a way in which the, the creation of an archive was not supposed to be this pristine thing, inaccessible. And it was here for a reason. Um, this is, um, I think about Max Bond, the great architect who designed the building. I mean, I think about my dear friend, Deb Willis, who was the you know, curator, photo curator in, in library, here for a long time, and really, really had a huge impact. I think about you know, you know Howard Dodson, you know back in those days, you know you, this was this was like more than a library, you know I have to say it. I love this place, I love it, you know, and and for the young people who don't know this, write down every single one of those names and look them up. If that's an answer. <laughs> so, when you were talking about what this place means to you. You weren't just talking about it as a place where things happen, but it also shaped, you know, it was part of what shaped your response to history happening. 9-11, mm -hmm. Amadou Diallo, you know, I remember I'm from, I grew up in Ohio, mm -hmm. that same year, Timothy Thomas was murdered by police, yes. there was Cincinnati riots, right? Um, 
And, you know, sometimes I tell people that was my 9-11. People didn't like that, you know, for the first <laughs> 10 or 20 years. Nowadays, no, nowadays people are fine with it, but. So how old were you when, the, the, it was April 2001? Yeah, I was 11. Wow. Yeah. And you remember that? It's one of the clearest memories I have of being a kid. Um, you know, that was when I realized what this was, or when right. I started to realize what this was. Right. The other moment is when President Bush gave Saddam Hussein 24 hours or 48 hours, whatever it was. I was like, oh, wow. Right. That's another part of what this is. So how is it that those kinds of big events um, shape what you think the role of black radical imagination is mm -hmm. in the current political moment? Right. Oh boy, that's a hard question. Um, well, let me go, let me, let's begin with Cincinnati, because I'm glad you brought that up. And by the way, I'm finishing a book right now called Black Body Swinging. Um, the subtitle's changing, but it's something like an American postmortem. And it's a chapter, a long chapter, uh, about Timothy Thomas. It's called The Price of the Ticket. And if you know his story, you know what that means. Um, and I think that we, it's amazing how much of these black radical insurgencies get erased in history. And you know, if you see any photographs or images, and you know this because you were in Ohio, of what Cincinnati looked like in 2001 in April, uh, it looked like Ferguson. I mean, from the upside down flag to the, you know, it looked like Minneapolis, to the burning of the police department. That was a rebellion. And in fact, if you really study the history of Cincinnati in that period of time, there's two things to note. Uh, Timothy Thomas was like number 15 of black people killed by the police in like a 10 year period, less than 10 years. Um, not to mention all the people who were just beaten by the police. Um, Number one. And number two, uh, much of the anarchist, you know, um, black, um, black box kind of, you know, rebellion stuff, they were, they, the anarchists converged on Cincinnati and, were, and they were actually involved in some of the um, attacks on property, which is really, really interesting. Um, but it's amazing how people could look at Ferguson and not make reference to Cincinnati. Cincinnati was the biggest rebellion at the beginning of the 21st century, right? This is April 2001. Um, but this is not a direct answer, but this continual forgetting, mm -hmm. this erasure, and what it leaves us is a sense that A, whatever is happening now is the first time it ever happened, and B, there's no intergenerational relationships. Yep. And Cincinnati is a great example where you had organizing in that city for a very long time. The chapter I wrote actually, actually goes back, I'm glad you had read from, um, that novella read from uh, Beloved. The chapter goes back to Margaret Garner to really understand how Cincinnati became, especially the, the neighborhood called Over the Rhine, which was going through a process of gentrification and there's a relationship between state violence and gentrification. That's, that we, gentrification itself is a form of violence, but it's a direct relationship between ways places are policed, right, and gentrification. So you could reproduce that. Um, and then the other thing is the intergenerational, again, inter intergenerational connections because there were movements that existed before that. Same thing with Ferguson. Um, if, you were, if you were around Ferguson in that period after August 9th, 2014, you would have seen a lot of young people on the streets, but you would have seen some young people in conversation with other generations, you know, people like Jamala Rogers and Organization for Black Struggle, and these kinds of organizations that were there for a long, long time in conversation, training, teaching, and learning from young people. Um, and that's what the tradition actually looks like. Um, what's the definition of the black radical tradition? Well, Cedric Robinson calls it um, revolutionary consciousness uh, that proceeds from the whole historical experience of the black people. That is to say that it's not enough to see black, work, black people as just workers in a workplace 
or black people dealing with police brutality um, or even reacting to forms of oppression, you, c come in. Yeah, there's this a seat right there. Yeah, if you just please, yeah, come on in. It's like, you know, I, I, the more the merrier. I, I feel good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so in many ways, if that's the case, it means that capitalism, settler colonialism, you know, these sorts of systems don't define black struggle. They're the context for it, but they don't define it. And so part of what Cedric Robertson is saying, the whole historical experience is to say where we're from, what we believe, where we worship, how we carry ourselves, how we use language, what we dream about, what we, what we, you know, what we see when we close our eyes, what we want. And it can't be like reduced, reducible to a reaction to racial capitalism or to state violence. And that is the tradition. That's why when you study what happens both in the streets of these momentary rebellions, which are momentary, you've got to pay attention to all the things that happened before that, all the moments, not just the moments of trauma, but the moments of joy, the moments of community making. You know, um, people come out together, sometimes knowing each other in friendship, and sometimes they come out not knowing each other, but becoming, developing new relationships in the process. And how you do that has to do with who you are. And who we are as black people can, is not reducible to like the things we need and want. Does that make sense? Yes. That's a, that's a good transition to the next thing I wanted to ask, which is to start talking about kind of some of the central ideas and themes that go through this book and that this book responds to. And you, in your response just now, you got it, one of them, right? This black radical tradition, re, uh, you know, radical politics that comes from the whole of black experience, not just black people as workers. What's the relationship of that to the practice or tradition that is the title of the book, right? To Freedom Dreams. And um, what is, maybe, maybe let's start there. I'll come okay. to the second part, yeah. Yeah, so, um, I should, I should confess that I'm a student of Cedric Robinson. He's um, the third most influential teacher I've ever had. I didn't mention the second, uh, who's actually is not here, was gonna make it, and that is um, my third grade teacher, Jane Andreas, who taught me at, in, at PS 28, uh, and had a whole classroom of students uh, who basically was almost like way, way beyond Montessori. We're like, you do whatever you want to do as long as you apply yourself and focus. Uh, and she gave us a kind of freedom to think about poetry as knowledge. I learned that in the third grade from my teacher, Jane Andreas. So Cedric Robinson was my third most important teacher in my life. And, um, and so in many ways, Freedom Dreams was shaped by what I learned from him, uh, writing black Marxism, you know, black movements, and all these other books that he, 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 he wrote. Uh, so what is Freedom Dreams? Freedom Dreams, in many ways, might be described as um, the practice, the, the, trans, the sort of the transmutation of practice into knowledge, into ideas, into um, aspirations of what is it people are fighting for. Uh, so it's one thing to talk about the whole historical experience of the black people and how it shapes how we respond. And some of those responses tend to be things like marinage, for example, uh, where the idea is not necessary to try to overthrow a system that you already think is corrupt, but to leave, get out of Dodge. You know, Part of the beauty of Harlem is we're gonna have a place for, of our own, mm -hmm. right? As black people, Mount, Bow Mount Bayou, Mississippi, or whatever. Um, you know, so there's that. And then the other part is to sort of create a politics that's grounded not in just material need and want, but ethics. I'm talking to philosophers, so you know, I, you know more about ethics than I do uh, in terms of structurally. 
but ethics, a moral universe. Um, and Freedom Dreams, in some ways, is trying to pull out of social movements what is it that people are striving to, to, to where are they trying to go, you know, as a movement. And one of the most important things that I always focus on in the book, and, you know, Antonio Gramsci has this idea of the philosophy of practice, um, and I think some of that applies, that social movements produce new ideas. They don't start with them, and then those ideas are, um, are just kind of ready-made, but they change over time. And just like I, in the, the passage I read, I talk about people in motion. People are always in motion. Overy, how you doing? I, I know, we're going to talk, <laughs> for sure. Um, uh, but people are always in motion. And that motion means that there's no way that the freedom dream stands still. It shifts over time. Um, and, and that's, I think, really, really important because it ties freedom dreaming as a verb as a practice, always dynamic, always shifting, with the black radical tradition, which is never static either. Mm -hmm. But, um, and it means that when the historical experiences of black people collectively change, so does that tradition. Yeah, that's one of the things I was struck by rereading this to prepare for today. You know, um, a lot of times when you talk about different trends in black radical tradition, black, black radical practice, you describe things, um, you describe things people are doing as kind of picking up on possibilities or even actual practices that maybe had existed in other generations and maybe fallen out of use or changed in one way and now it's being changed in a different way. Um, so one of the things I wanted to make sure to ask you today is the black radical tradition, as opposed to just black politics or black life or black action, what is, what is the relationship between black radical tradition and just any way of being black or responding to black history? Mm -hmm. um, what's the... You know, what's in that distinction, if there is one? Um, and if there is one, what's clarifying about that distinction? Right, okay, that's a really good question. Um, one thing I just have to be really clear about is that being black doesn't make you radical. <laughs> just, I'm just saying. Um, and I know we should take that for granted, but, you know, I, but sometimes that's not always the case. And in fact, it's, so there's a couple things. One, at the very basic level, um, I was very s specific about the kinds of movements I wanted to write about. That were movements, um, whether you want to think of the left-right spectrum, I mean, sometimes you think of them as on the left, but even that doesn't quite work always. But they're, quite, but they're, they're movements that are calling for deep, deep fundamental transformation, and oftentimes they bump up against what? Black elites black people who are against that. And, and they're not all the same. So part of, part of the way the book's structured, it really is autobiographical in terms of my own trajectory. I mean, I started out um, being drawn into black nationalism, you know? I mean, you know, I, I read uh, George E.M. James' Stolen Legacy, you know, uh, Chancellor Williams, that's, those are my texts growing up, you know? And I was a nationalist, and, but not necessarily a radical nationalist, and it sort of moved into more radical nationalism, and then from there, Marxism, and so you go from, from sort of the, the struggle for uh, free land, uh, freeing the land, to uh, communism, and then third world radicalism, uh, and then reparations, which we could talk about, because you wrote a fantastic book on it, um, and black feminism, which, you know, is also a, one, the most radical critique of the way in which the nationalists and the Marxists and others have sort of framed the problem mm. and framed the, 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 how, to, how to get free. Uh, and not just black feminism, but black feminism, black queer feminism, you know, that is part of that 
deeply radical tradition. And again, it's, when we talk about the whole historical experiences, the whole historical experience is not every single black person all at the same time. It's, it's uneven and mixed. So you're talking about forms of oppression reproduced within movements that claim to be radical. Mm -hmm. And then you get to surrealism and all that stuff. So, so part of, um, uh, part of what, what sort of in answering your question that I want to point to is that this book is a, tw is a book about the 20th century for the most part. If you were to compare to, say, Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, um, it's, it's not a 20th century book, per se. So Black Marxism is a book that identifies the roots of the Black, black radical tradition in the experience of slavery and post-slavery sort of reconstructions, of in, in whether you're talking about Haiti or North America or elsewhere. Uh, but, Part of what he's arguing is that these three black intellectuals, and, this, and he's just choice. He's not saying that no other intellectual fits in this category. He's not saying these three black intellectuals, W.B. Du Bois, Richard Wright, C.L.R. James, are somehow the black radical tradition. He's not saying that. He's saying they discover it. So imagine a book about three intellectuals who are faced with fascism, because that is the context. Mm -hmm. And through fascism, they go back and try to understand the dynamics of racial capitalism. And Du Bois does it through black reconstruction. C.L.R. James does it through the um, Haitian Revolution with black Jacobins. Uh, Richard Wright does it through the novel, right? Whether it's black boy, native son, the outsider. And they're all trying to understand it from that perspective. But Cedric wrote the whole book in his context, his world which is Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique. That's the world that he's writing from to understand those intellectuals understanding the past. So I wrote a book about largely 20th century movements with the exception of the, the first chapter, the largely 20th century movements. What does that mean? It means that the whole historical experience of the black people have shifted pretty dramatically from where it was in the 18th and 19th century. And what that means is that in this book, a lot of those stories are stories in which the opposition to the black, to um, the freedom dreams are people who look like the people who are fighting. Mm -hmm. There's shifts. One of the things that we have witnessed is the success, although it's under attack right now by the right, uh, of liberal multiculturalism. Liberal multiculturalism has given us an integrated ruling class. Has it freed us? Heck no. <laughs> it's made it more difficult. It's created more problems and more challenges. Right? So part of, of, of locating that is not, I'm not making the, the claim that all black people 100% are all sort of together lockstep in this black radical tradition. Sometimes that radical tradition um, is a handful of people in a state called Mississippi mm -hmm. who believe that they can win and they are not the majority. So that's what it looks like sometimes. If that answers the question. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Everyone's so quiet. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this is the Schoenberg, you know? Yeah, you can. Well, thank you. You can agree. You can heckle. I, pre you know. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to see. You. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. Um, that's actually that that parallel helps, right? So, uh, Cedric Robinson is writing in the context of, you know, a global anti-colonial mm -hmm. movement. Um, so before the Second World War, the British Empire alone is right. controlling a quarter of the world's surface area and population. Uh, much of the world is under colonial domination. The beginnings of most of the world getting national independence mm -hmm. from colonial empires uh, is the period starting from, I guess you could say, 47 to 70, the end of the 70s, right. which is when Robinson's writing Black Marxism. 
And in this new context, in the context of the kind of triumph of neoliberalism and a particular kind of multiculturalism that goes with you know, liberalism, um, you write freedom dreams. And what you reach for in the 20th century tradition as, you know, as useful forms of black radical traditional thought and practice um, are surrealism and black feminism. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could say, what is it about both of those that has attracted so many people to those ways of thinking and, right. and moving? What is it that attracts you to these ways of thinking and moving? And you know, now in 2022, that's what year it is, right? Right. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> now in 2022, what do you think, um, should attract us to these? Right, no, that's a really good question. And by the way, you know, one of the, one of the things that's different about, and, and Cedric understood this, about like World War I, when he talks about the making of a radical black petty bourgeoisie. And by the way, blackish is not about that, just so you know, <laughs> um, in case you wondered. But I think about Elite Capture, your brilliant book, and Elite Capture in, in many ways is something that could happen uh, you know, more effectively, and it's something that's so much a late 20th and 21st century phenomenon because the radical black petty bourgeoisie of that sort of post-World War I period is a kind of class that is trying to find its place. It's a class under colonialism. It's a class that's supposed to do the work of the colonial order, and yet still dealing with the kind of racism Right? But imagine what it, what it means if we still have the racism, but you're able to be fully incorporated. Mm. I mean, that's part of elite capture, like that you talk about. That level of incorporation, which is much greater now than it was, say, 100 years ago, uh, does make a difference you know, in terms of who we understand our friends and enemies to be. Because you know, we talk about the expansion of the carceral state and if you start making a list of all the black people who signed on um, ink, some of the legislation that put us in prison much longer, it's a long list. It's a long list. Um, to go back, and this is where, uh, again, people in motion, um, black feminism itself has a, 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 a miraculous history. Uh, and, you know, I'm always, worried that sometimes we, we don't think historically, we think that ideas are fixed, that what, um, uh, what Charlotte Fortin, what Anna Julia Cooper, as brilliant as they were, that what they're saying is exactly what Angela Davis or Barbara Smith or you know, Demeter, Demeter Frazier are saying. And they may have roots, they may have relationships, they may have connections, but it's not the same thing because movements change. You know, we're dealing right now with an expansive revolutionary insurgency that embraces, not always, but, but should, uh, you know, a queer theory of the world that embraces trans movements, that embraces feminism that is um, pro-sex feminism, you know, as opposed to, you know, what, what was once called culture of dissemblance. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities and things that are actually not part of some tradition. And when I say tradition, you know, d d sometimes we think, okay, if, you know, if we can just go back to the way things were, to our traditional culture. Well, not everything in traditional culture is worth saving. Yep. And I could prove it because people who were considered traditional gave up things <laughs> back then. If you ever see the film Mulad, for example, where there's things that you save and things that you discard. And everything that we often call tradition is in some ways part of an invention of tradition. So in Mulad, there's a, this incident, well, I won't tell you the whole story, but um, it's sort of like there's a, a contest between the, an Islamic tradition, which is seen as traditional, versus what preceded it. And that what preceded it actually empowered women to be able to turn their homes into, into fortresses to defend other girls and women. And that was Mulad, that was a protection. 
Um, and so the same thing we see, uh, we see new ideas, and Freedom Dreams is also about creativity and improvisation and inventing new ideas. The Combahee River Collective, which is one of the most important documents ever written in the 20th century, um, itself does draw on ideas that have been around, like the need for socialism, but they're also new ideas. A, a sense of that identity politics, not identity politics as, as a form of exclusion, but identity politics as a way of understanding the multiple layers of oppression and exploitation so that we could actually address them and create the society that truly is fully democratic and open and empowering for the people. Um, that's what they lay out as a plan in the Kumbahi River Collective Statement. Um, and you mentioned surrealism. I mean, I, I was interested, I won't say much more because you could read the book. Um, you know, I was always, you know, like a lot of Marxists coming up, a little bit wary about the disconnect between the moral and ethical universe that my mother raised us in based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. And, you know, and I, I have Christians in my family, you know, my, my grandfather and all this other stuff, but that wasn't really the root of it. I'm not saying that it's not there, it's there too. So I can make an argument that there are people who grew up in a certain kind of uh, uh, prophetic Christianity where sometimes that doesn't fit with a kind of Marxist viewpoint. And that becomes a problem. I mean, you know, uh, my friend, colleague, uh, Aubrey Hendricks has written brilliant books, by the way, about this, you know, about the fact that Christianity in some ways has lost its way. And if you connect uh, Aubrey's book there with even Cedric Robinson's writing about the origins of socialism, he argues that socialism has origins not in Marxism, but in the old ancient Baptists of the uh, first four centuries of, of the millennia. Uh, that that's one of the sources. So all that to say is that surrealism opened up a path for me to talk about the spiritual dimensions of freedom dreams. That is, what is it that you can sort of um, pull from the unconscious? Uh, and although most surrealists are, are secular, there's a way in which a lot of black people are drawn to surrealism because they saw spiritual practices like Pokemania, Milism, they saw Santeria, like Wilfredo Lam, they saw practices in which you have certain sources of power that you could draw from, uh, and that not just power, but certain ways of thinking about, you know, what is the psychic dimension of exploitation? What's the psychic dimension of freedom? What does freedom really feel like, as opposed to how do you legislate it? And that's partly what the surrealism chapter tries to do, it's not perfect, um, but then nothing is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a perfect transition to the next question. <laughs> um, because I think um, when we talk about the things we're trying to achieve in terms of the, in terms of a moral and political, ethical dimension of the world, mm -hmm. as you talk about under, um, um, in response to black feminism or in response to surrealism, the kind of spiritual dimensions right. of another world, all of these things that um, tie together to utopianism. Okay. Um, certain people, especially on whatever the left is, will get nervous. Right. Right? What's, <laughs> you know, how can we? How can we get the perfect or free world? Uh, why is it even relevant to think about the perfect or free world given this particularly messed up world that we're in? And so I wanted to ask you about that, but in particular to ask you about that, keeping in mind how far we are from 157th and Amsterdam, right. which is where you describe your mother giving you a very different and and very daily practical conception of what utopianism is and what it means and what it has to do with living in a non-perfect world. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and I use that word utopian uh, in that first introduction. Um, that's an excellent question. 
Man, no wonder you got such a good job. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a brilliant chat here. Um, okay, first of all, my, it's funny because there's different definitions of utopian. And, um, and one is the idea of trying to create the perfect world. And that's not the definition that I've ever thought about and used. I like the definition, which is classic definition. Of course, you know better than me because you're a philosopher. Uh, but the definition that Jane Cortez, who's also with the ancestors now, who also was, uh, is a major figure in that chapter on surrealism, and I didn't mention that. Jane Cortez and Ted Jones were the ones that schooled me on that. But Jane Cortez um, has this beautiful book and a poem called Somewhere in Advance of Nowhere. Hmm. And what she's saying is def the formal definition of utopian is nowhere. Okay, this is very important, it's nowhere. Uh, so it doesn't make it perfect, it means that it's not here. And it's not something that's not achievable, but it's not here now. So my mother's utopianism was actually ironically never about the future. Uh, it was about the present. Uh, it was about seeing beauty everywhere in real time. She didn't see things for potential. She saw them for what they were and said, did you see that? I mean, I have this, this line, which I, I think is a beautiful line in the original introduction where she, you know, she would say, you know, we'd be walking up the street and, you know, when are the fire hydrants open, you know, back in the days in the summertime, and, you know, the water would squirt, squirt on our bodies, but it also would go down the gutter. And when you look in the gutter as the water is going down, reflecting the sunlight, you see the alchemy of motor oil and water and sunlight, and you see a rainbow in mm -hmm. the gutter. And my mom said, do you see that rainbow? She didn't make it up. It was there. I could prove it. Scientists could prove it, right? So that's what, so for her, it was never about the future is about the moment, about planting seeds for what the future could be. And, and for me, I one of the key themes of Freedom Dreams is the argument that what draws people to movements uh, isn't feeling oppressed. Mm. It's the possibility of making sure the oppression ends. In other words, you, you join movements and risk your life um, and your time, use your time, not just because you're mad, but because you actually think that this might win, that you might win, that you might actually change the situation. If you don't think it's gonna change, why would you do it, right? So if you think of, of utopian as nowhere, somewhere in advance of nowhere, that you're advancing toward that nowhere that could be something else, then think about what utopian practice means. It means working three jobs to educate your kids, mm -hmm. that's utopian. Mm -hmm. Because you like, you know, you're, you're kicking, you're, you're like drive yourself crazy working really hard to make sure your kids get the best education possible because you know there's a better life for them. Like you know what's there, you can't prove it, but you know what's there. What's more utopian than being in Mississippi in 1958 and believing that you can not only get the right to vote, but take the state? Mm -hmm. That's utopian. What's more utopian than being in Detroit and saying we're moving down to Jackson and we're gonna take the city and we're gonna take the state and we're gonna create um, a new society for us, right? What's more utopian than making art, you know? I mean, making art is about uh, not doing the practical thing, you know? And that's the thing that I think we, we get stuck thinking that we're striving to produce a utopia as opposed to doing all the things that in relationship to our reality, which is exactly what you're saying, is utopic. Mm. And, and, if, and if, if it's true that people are always in motion and freedom dreams are therefore in motion, then what is utopic is in motion as well, you know? And that's the way I see it. And, um, and I have to say, I, I, there's a quote here from Dr. King that really was a source in many ways of the title of the book. And it's from the prep, but I just have to read it because it's relevant. Um, it's, and he says, um, he says, we Negroes 
have long dreamed of freedom, but still we are confined in an oppressive prison of segregation and discrimination. Like that is the reality. Must we respond with bitterness and cynicism? Certainly not, for this will destroy and poison our personalities. And by the way, let me just clarify something. He's not saying, he's not saying be nice to white people. He's saying cynicism as is destroying us, mm. our soul, right? He, let's be clear about that. Then he says, to guard ourselves from bitterness, we need the vision to see this generation's ordeals, the opportunity to transfigure both ourselves and American society. Our present suffering and our nonviolent struggle to be free may well offer Western civilization the kind of spiritual dynamic so desperately needed for survival. You know, yeah, you give it up. <laughs> that's Dr. King. I mean, and that's where I got the title Freedom Dreams from, right? But think about what that means. So anyone who says, well, you know, we have this concrete reality and that stuff is utopian, we're all utopian. Yeah. Everyone who's in a movement who believes that movements can change things, you cannot be not utopian. Right? Yeah. right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I feel bad because I feel all inspired now, and my next <laughs> question is just kind of a, a dash of cold water. Um, <laughs> but, but maybe you can bring it back. Um, but one thing I was struck by in what you were saying just now, and when I was rereading the book in particular, the parts of the book that are really stressing this idea of utopianism and possibility is one, how much of that is also a description of the forces of the right and yeah. what we're up against, right? We're all utopian, but right. that unfortunately right. includes the people who are trying to make the world a worse place. Yes. Um, but also how that differently frames what it is that we're trying to do in the black radical tradition with utopian thoughts. So just two examples. Um, earlier, you referenced Over the Rhine now. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I was, you can take this with a grain of salt, I was just a little suburban, you know, bougie, scared kid. But in 2001, Over the Rhine was a place I would not go. Right. It's not a place, you know, it's, it's not a place that has, that had then the class composition or the businesses that it has now, all the things that come with gentrification, right? Um, now it's a place where you get yogurt, essentially, right? right? That's, yes, that's right. what happened to Over the Rhine. That's right. And that was, somebody planned that. That was somebody's vision of what Over the Rhine should be and who should live in Over the Rhine and who should have access to Over the Rhine. Right. And the other example that always occurs to me is New Orleans. Um, it had a public school system. Now it has almost exclusively a charter school system. Right. The opportunity for reshaping New Orleans according to a vision that meets the needs of capital was provided by a hurricane. Right. But the vision was provided by the kind of people that build charter schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how does the idea of utopianism not just frame what we're trying to do and what we're thinking of, but also the contest that we're in, also the thing we're trying to fight back against? Right, right. OK, a couple things. Um, one, you know, two, two terms, radical and utopian, are not necessarily um, liberatory. Because those people who went out and tried to uh, you know, overthrow the government on January 6th, they were radical. Mm -hmm. But we, so we got to understand that, you know, that they were radical, although this definition is radical. One, one definition is to go to the root. Um, another one is to be extremist. And if you ever hear Malcolm X talk about being extremist, it's really brilliant you know, uh, speech he gives about what it means to be an extremist. So those are extremists. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing a good thing. Um, our enemies you know, do the same. Uh, what, what we have to do is be clear about the principles, right? Um, neoliberalism 
is utopian. Because what neoliberalism is about is saying that we're gonna live in this magical world where uh, capital has no boundaries whatsoever, no stops, no limits, and that magical world will just, you know, be the, the structure. And if you get on board and if you succeed, you can get rich. And the rest of y'all will either work or just die. And that's utopian. And the, and the state is gonna shrink unless it's gonna deal with stuff around military and security and protecting capital. That's a, that's a utopian vision, neoliberalism. And, and back when they were coming up with that, that stuff in around World War I and, after, and, and during the, the Great Depression, people thought, that's impossible. You can't ever have that. And what would we get in New Orleans? A neoliberal experience, a experiment after Katrina, where they're like, okay, we're gonna eliminate the kinds of protections for the poor, uh, we're gonna expand the police state, and we're gonna privatize everything, schools, public transportation, we're gonna do all that, we're gonna destroy all the unions, because in the utopian neoliberal imagination, there's no such thing as society. It's just everyone's out for themselves, um, unless, of course, you're a cartel, mm -hmm. and then, you know, capital takes care of each other, you know, and then the rest of y'all is supposed to like not have the right to fight back collectively. So all that's utopian. So I, I, I totally agree with you. We just have to share the principles um, of what is it that we are trying to build. And that's where the question of ethics and morals comes in. Um, there's nothing ethical about neoliberalism at all. There's nothing ethical about the idea that there's some kind of fake invisible hand that runs a market and some people do well and some people don't. If there's a system where some people don't do well, then the idea ethically is to make sure that they do well, that you fix it so that they can do well, fix it so they don't starve, fix it so they're not living in food deserts, right? Um, and I live in, look, I live in, um, in Los Angeles. I miss New York, though it's changed. But I, I, I live in LA in, in a, a decent neighborhood, but you know, ASAP Rocky lives around the corner from me, you know? <laughs> And they and people driving up Lamborghinis everywhere. Um, there's nothing ethical about the. And by the way, all these rappers in my neighborhood, they're all Republican. Just so you know, all of them, <laughs> all of them. You know, it's like we we I, we had a really nice, quiet Jewish community, and all these like rappers moving with the Republican, you know, Lamborghinis and stuff like that. It's just terrible. <laughs> The neighborhood is just fine. Make rap great again. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just joking. Actually, I'm not joking that much. But, <laughs> but, but to go back to this question of, of, of sort of where we are, um, you know, Over the Rhine is a really good, and I know our time is, is up, but Over the Rhine is a really good example, uh, you know, where there's a long, there's a long fight. Over the Rhine, by the way, is a neighborhood in Cincinnati. It's near downtown. It once was an old German community where the German left was there. That was like, and, and some of the black socialists, like Peter H. Clark, would like hang out in this German neighborhood that was actually, you know, not really racist because these like the, the 1848ers lived there. They move out. It became um, a place for the Appalachian white work class for a long time, uh, who are struggling with very little in terms of a welfare state support for them. And eventually, that community was replaced by, uh, by black people, but especially a large homeless community. And all this capital came in from the federal government to boost up the neighborhood and st set the stage for gentrification, but the homeless population refused to leave. There were, there was they were hanging out there, and there was a, a, a place called the, uh, the Dew Drop-In Center, which they were trying to get rid of homeless people. So the police came rolling up in there um, to move, move people. Now there was a, uh, an amazing, because even though in 2001, you would feel um, like uncomfortable going there. I gave a talk there in two, April, you know, it was May 2001, right after the uprising. I'm an old person, you know. 
And there was something called the Center for Community Engagement that was created right there and over the Rhine in the community um, that was about bringing scholars, architects, you know, activists together to have a conversation about what to do. And they were fighting gentrification, you know. Um, and they were doing things like uh, bringing architecture students to take abandoned houses and to refurbish them and move homeless people in. And the gentrifying forces were like, no, you can't do that. And, and with the help of eminent domain, with the help of a lot of different forces, tax abatements, they waged war. They, and there was a radical petty bourgeoisie from the universities who are fighting on the side of the, the black population there that got beat in the process. And New Orleans is a very similar situation, except for many of the folks who saw themselves as the radical petty bourgeoisie who meant to, went to New Orleans post-Katrina to try to do reconstruction work, they end up moving in some of those apartments and replacing the people who got pushed out in Houston. And they're there. It's all these white people like, hey, I came to help, and you know, now I got a coffee shop. You know, I mean. <laughs> so this is the reality. What this comes down to, the fundamental point of all that I'm saying in these stories is that this is the nature of struggle. We have allies, we have um, principles, we have um, aspirations, and sometimes they get derailed when we lose our principles. Sometimes we're moving in a direction that we think is really revolutionary, but realize it's there, we're pushing for reforms that don't actually change the terms. They reinforce the systems of oppression. So all the goodwill in the world in New Orleans or Cincinnati or South LA or wherever doesn't always translate into power. Right. And that's why it's imperative to work together in community and struggle, to always argue with each other about what are the consequences of our actions, to always be ready to pivot and shift directions, to be improvisational, to think. And that's what Freedom Dreams is about. It's about thinking, not just, not just feeling, not just dreaming, but thinking through crisis so that we can, again, be prepared to fight what is a very long fight, right? One that may never end, but one that we are not about, it's not about winning, but about creating the ground and holding that ground so that we can develop power and know that when we hold power, sometimes it blows back against us, but then we do something else, right? That's what this book's about. And you can buy this book if you want. <laughs> Oh, and, and one, one last thing before we go, just, to, just to, to, to one last very thing before we, we can go. We're going to do this book signing, and, and I say this everywhere I go, if, and this is, I'm not being funny here, but if, if anyone is really indigent and like you want the book, I will buy it for you, okay? Honestly, that happens. Every bookstore I go to, I say that. If you, don't, if you really want it, I'll get it, and they'll take care of it. But other than that, but if you're not indigent and you're lying, then <laughs> you're, you're going to have to deal with, with whoever in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we did, we do have time. We're going we're gonna to play it by ear. We're going to take one question okay. right now. One audience question. So if you feel good about your question, go ahead, stand up, go to the mic at the back of the room. Make sure it's a question and not a comment, as uh, my neighbor liked to say. <laughs> hey, Novella. Hey, oh. Hi, Nicole. Hey, how you doing? Oh, oh, hi, Nicole. How you doing? I can't see anything with these lights. <laughs> I had a question. I feel like you said we, we are not changing the, no, you said we're in movements because we feel that movements can change things. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking you're linking your radical imagination is steeped and rooted in hope. Mm -hmm. That's correct? It is, it is. Although I do, I hedge a little bit. Yeah, because I was about to push back on Yeah, no, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't use the word hope. In fact, I don't think it comes up in the book. 
in, 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 in the new introduction, I actually say that, you know, it's not hope at all. So what would you say it is, and that was my question, if it's not hope, what would you say that is that makes us join these movements? What is it? I wouldn't say like, I would say hip hop is a, a great popular form of like how we use our radical imagination. I would not say hip hop was created because we had hope in changing mm -hmm. um, the genre of music. We right. are brilliant and we're resilient. Maybe those are some of the words I would use. And determined is actually the wor a better word that I would That's use. That's the word that I use in this book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I, and I'll, I'll, read, I'll read this to you because I'm just part of it. Um, I say, you know, and this is the part I would have read if I didn't read about uh, Sekou. Um, it's in the face of growing pessimism, freedom of dreams may come across as too hopeful and optimistic in these dark times, but the book is hardly optimistic. In fact, the word optimism never appears in a book. Only optimistic, and that's quoting Jane Cortez. Uh, nor does the word pessimism appear, although pessimistic comes up once in describing the post-emancipation generation's outlook on the future. When I use the word hope, it does not mean wishful thinking or even dreaming. The black radical imagination is not a dream state conjured and nurtured independent of day-to-day -day struggle, um, but rather forged in collective movements. My central point is that we cannot divorce critical analysis from social movements. That is to say, um, you know, we live in this world where we blog and we tweet, but if you're not engaged in social movements, you, you can't possibly um, actually come to terms with what is necessary. And being involved in social movements is about determination, about being determined. The challenge of solidarity and deep understanding of the mechanisms of oppression generate uh, the conditions and requirements for new modes of analysis. Um, and I so said, we must also understand uh, that, oh no, I skipped that part. So this is the part. The book does not prioritize freedom dreams to the exclusion of fascist nightmares. If anything, I show that freedom dreams are born of fascist nightmares, or better yet, born against fascist nightmares. So de being determined, which I use, is the only thing we have. We, I, don't, I think that the, the language of hope is problematic, right? Because it's almost like you're wishing, yeah. you know? I would not tell someone that, oh, no, you need to be pessimistic, because I think pessimism is, pessimism is only useful if it's revolutionary pessimism, mm. and, which is not Afro-pessimism. Right. Revolutionary pessimism <laughs> refers to specifically the idea that we are faced with catastrophe, and we have no choice but to confront it. That's good. Yeah. Right? That's different. That's not saying, like, we can win, we can, no. It's like, we don't have a choice. We have to stand up, right? We have to confront catastrophe. Um, and that is the revolutionary pessimism, right, of, of Pierre Neville and other people. And then finally, one last thing um, that I had written here, which is part of the speech I gave um, at Socialism uh, Conference. I say, you know, these, right, these movements were fueled, whoops, no, I'm losing my, Okay, these movements were fueled not by false optimism, but by a deep understanding of reality. They are trying to sustain life by beating back the death-dealing structures of gendered racial capitalism. The only way to ensure survival for black people was to envision a radically different future for all and fight to bring it in its existence. That's a black radical tradition. You know, it's about life against death-dealing structures, and it's refusing to give up. You know, and that's where we are. That's where we've been. So thank you, Nicole. It's good to see you. Thank you. I think we were enriched by that last question. I thank you all for joining us here. We will have the book signing, and he's already giving you a directive around need and, and not need. Um, and I hope that you all will also think about Olufemi's latest book, Elite Capture, which is also available yes. in the Schomburg shop and highly recommended. Thank you all for joining us and visit the Schomburg's website for more information.